very warm welcome to all of you. As I just mentioned, we are going to be recording from a moment onwards. Um, so please, if you don't want to be seen or recorded, turn off your camera and your microphone. Um, a very, very warm welcome from my side to this second expert talk hosted by us, the International Alliance Against Health Risks in Wildlife Trade. In fact, we have this format and a several, several other formats. So if you haven't been included on our mailing list and you're interested, please let us know. My name is Constanza Riedle, and I have the pleasure of accompanying all of you in the coming 75 minutes. Now, identifying and reducing human health risks from wildlife trade needs an internationally coordinated and cooperative approach. And to this very end, the International Alliance Against Health Risks in Wildlife Trade, initiated by the German government, both Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and the Ministry for the Environment, serves as an inclusive and interdisciplinary platform to discuss challenges and formulate solutions. Today, I am very happy to introduce to you and welcome Richard Koch and Hernan Cáceres Escobar, to share their insights from investigating the links between wildlife and the emergence of infectious zoonoses and EIDs. They are both lead authors of the upcoming situation analysis on the roles and risks of wildlife in the emergence of human infectious diseases by the IUCN Special uh, Species Survival Commission, SSC, which most of you will know. We decided to first really give them some time, some 45 minutes, uh, to hear their presentation, their insights, and then open the floor to the comments and discussions, questions and answers. During this first 45 minutes, please feel free to post comments or questions in the chat and we'll come back to them later on. Richard Koch is probably a, a name to most of you, but let me briefly introduce him and Anand to you so you know who we're listening to. Richard Koch is a wildlife veterinary ecologist, infectious disease researcher, and conservationist, and was co-chair of the IUCN SSC Wildlife Health Specialist Group from 2004 all the way to the end of last year. He has worked almost entirely in the field of wildlife health and disease since 1980, with a focus on African and Asian ecosystems. He is on the WHO IHR and the OIE Crisis Management Committee expert list, an associate research fellow at Chatham House and past council member of the Wildlife Disease Association, where he remains active on various task forces and committees, and is an adjunct professor at Tufts University and Nala University as well. He holds a chair in wildlife health and emerging diseases, leading a research portfolio currently in the realm of 1.5 million pounds in the fields of wildlife and zoonosis at the Pathobiology and Population Sciences Department at the Royal Veterinary College. So glad to have you here, Richard. Very warm welcome. Now, Anand Casares Escobar, I hope I get the pronunciation more or less right, Anand, um, is a veterinarian and conservation scientist. He studies the links between anthropogenic-driven environmental change, biodiversity loss, and emerging infectious diseases. He uses transdisciplinary participatory approaches and modeling techniques to develop innovative evidence-based interventions and policies for an ever-changing world. He has a diverse international background and practical experience working with multicultural teams at the interface of science, policy, and practice with local and indigenous communities, government agencies, NGOs, IGOs, industry partners, and academics. In his current position at Sapienza University, he's combining his skills to explore how anthropogenic driven environmental change affects disease hazards to create future scenarios at risk. So I think it's quite clear that you're a very good fit to what we try to achieve with the Alliance, bringing together various disciplines. And with that, and with no further ado, I'd, I'd like to give you the floor. So please, I think, Richard, you'll start, correct? Yes, indeed. I'll uh, just share the screen so we can get the presentation up. Excellent. Uh, now. <clears throat> 
trying to check. Can we? Oh, why it's not? It's just. I'm not so familiar with MTA for this, but I'm just looking. It says share screen here, but I can't see include com presenter mode screen, I guess, and then try and get yeah, something. OK, can you see that? It's just um, yeah. Now we can see the PDF, not good. the. Um, uh, oh, yeah. There we go. That looks great. Hang on. Uh, let me just let's just see if this comes up fully. Hang on. Now, does that work? It's not the presentation mode yet. No, we still see the slides on the left. OK, I uh, yeah, so we'll have to stop share desktop. Try to share again. This is where. Um, OK, it's got presenter mode here. Let's try Should we try to stop sharing. <coughs> So you've got you you've got a PDF there, have you? Yeah, we can. Okay, see that's the, yeah. that's actually the IUCN report. The uh, yeah, it's now in uh, proof. <laughs> We're so, happy to uh, see that as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's in proof. I've been looking at it today. So probably if I just somehow go through these until I eventually get to the right place, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think we might get there. That looks better now, doesn't it? And if I do that. Yep. We okay now? And, um, nope. Still no, not. Gone. If you want, and, I can um, also share. Yeah, uh, either. Uh, maybe we're gonna have to. I mean, I'm. You know, it's it, it's a trouble. You can see. I can see it, but you can't see it clearly. Tricky uh, I can share my my presentation. The presentation, if you want. What, why yeah. don't you do that? And you don't have to swap it then at the. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so I will stop sharing now, so you can pick it up. Is that working? Yes, perfect. OK, fine. And you will have to click it on, yeah? Yep. OK, well done. Super, all right. Um, all sorts of things are happening. Uh, is, it, is it stable now? Yeah. Okay. I think you can just start. Richard. All right, first slide. Yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction, Constanza. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, very it's kind. Anyway, uh, the, the, when, whenever we talk about our backgrounds, you know, we, you know, the older we are, we, we seem to have a long history. Um, anyway, uh, so wildlife's always been my my area of interest, but to get into this particular um, job, um, the SSC contacted me about um, a, a commission really to do a situation analysis at the time when there was you know considerable interest of course uh, with the emergence of COVID-19 um, and a number of uh, groups uh, around the world uh, did the same really to you know just to try and contribute to the debate and discussion uh, around possible wildlife sources for this problem um, and so we, we, we initiated this um, on the basis of wildlife trade, but um, anyway, next slide. Let's uh, let's get into it. And um, you know, it all sort of fitted with this overall planetary crisis uh, mode. You know, this race against time. And uh, uh, of course, many of us have been involved in different elements of this, uh, particularly in relation to um, to you know emerging type problems and diseases in particular. So. Um, it, you know, to get it into perspective and context is, is probably quite important. But I think uh, certainly after COVID-19, everybody appreciates uh, the economic impacts of these sorts of pandemic problems. And, and uh, you know, we don't have to argue our case particularly, but we do need, I think, to get uh, accuracy in, in the evidence that we present uh, as to risk and where risk comes from. The next slide. Yeah, so just to you know to, to repeat that there were a number of reports that were put together through various methods. So, um, so I'm mostly having an expert component. I, I hate the word expert, and I think when you work in the wildlife field, 
you're acutely aware that it's very difficult to be an expert across such a broad spectrum of species. Um, and so, you know, uh, we have to be very careful when, when somebody claims to be a wildlife uh, health expert because, um, you know, very challenging thing to be. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, various attempts were made and, you know, uh, some were done very rapidly. And in fact, I haven't uh, put up here, there was an FAO uh, rapid risk assessment done very, uh, very, ra very quickly uh, by a guy called El Masri and, <clears throat> and his colleagues and, you know, using standard formats. And, you know, they actually, I thought they were very, it was very good. It was a very good rapid assessment. And it basically said, we don't know. Um, but you know, we we estimated you know the risk actually of of a, a further event happening uh, you know beyond the one that was already there was was quite low, um, uh, or you know close to negligible actually. But anyway, the, it mostly based on the uncertainty. So I, so that I thought was quite a good uh, view. And and many of these other reports that came out, uh, I think, were very bold in their statements around particularly wildlife trade, um, and. Uh, you know, our report, which is coming out, is obviously quite a long time after these reports, but uh, we have put a lot of effort into it. Uh, I'm not saying it's necessarily going to be any better, but um, but we've given time uh, for things to evolve a bit, and the processes within IECN are quite complex, and it is a, a large body of, of people who are academically and professionally interested in wildlife um, and very concerned obviously about the conservation of species <clears throat> and how wildlife is perceived you know in the in the modern world um, where it's under such pressure so uh, we we had quite a battle I think with you know uh, getting it through getting the whole analysis through and we had a lot of support and input and in the in the publication when it finally comes out you'll see all the people that are, are acknowledged in this so quite a rigorous process and and we hope a very transparent process uh, where people had plenty of opportunity to to comment and review and i think this again is one of the dangers with many of these reports that there simply isn't time for people to to really uh to review and comment on them before they go out um, so anyway, our, our main focus had started with wildlife trade, but as we got into the evidence, it was clear there wasn't a huge amount of data there. So we felt it important to probably broaden it um, to beyond the trade itself and just looking at wildlife generally uh, and even you know its relationship with domestic animals. Um, so so that sort of is where we, we, we ended up. Next slide, please. One of the publications that has sort of underpinned the narrative, uh, particularly on emerging infectious diseases of humans, was a paper by uh, Kate Jones in 2008. Uh, and I remember this very well because I came back from Africa having spent um, 15 years working there in the Kenya Wildlife Service and with the African Union, um, Inter-African Bureau for Animal Resources, working on infectious diseases uh, in wildlife and at the Wildlife, Livestock and Human Interface. And, and you know, I came back to this and it was like a storm, really. I, I sort of came out of the wild, if you like, into a, a sort of modern society where this sort of thing is debated so much. Um, and I was, initially, I was quite surprised by the paper, but it, I thought it had some very excellent uh, aspects to it. But I was still concerned about the sort of narratives that could be um, developed from this. So uh, for this particular analysis, uh, I thought it would be quite a useful point to start to sort of review and reflect on that, on the database. And we had access, the database was, was public, um, to sort of reanalyze it and reflect on it in the context of the current narrative. So what we did was to sort of break down these things called emerging infectious diseases um, into different categories, because it's a very broad term and it's not been uh, really a, a result of consensus of global consensus um, it's sort of came from uh, mostly from the United States originally from Lederberg and others who, who started who used terms to categorize emerging diseases and the sort of categories were changes in region for example so increasing incidence perhaps expanding you know or reappearance uh, in different regions of a disease so that's not a new disease necessarily but certainly in new places. Then there was the uh, evolution of an existing organism. So, you know, you might uh, describe these things as variants, changes in a particular pathogen or the emergence of a particular pathogen, um, you know, through various means. Um, and then we have 
drug resistance, for example, and, and changes in virulence patterns in organisms that are not necessarily directly associated with some major evolutionary change, but, um, but they also are represented under emerging infectious diseases. And then we have new host range too, which is probably the one that we're most concerned about because it's like a host jump. It, you know, in other words, for a, a, an emerging human infectious disease, a truly novel human disease, um, it sort of has to has to jump from somewhere else um, or modify in some way uh, through contact with humans over time, and then eventually it becomes a disease of humans. So when you when you broke it down like that, um, it really was quite a small proportion of the organisms that were really these truly novel uh, things to be concerned about. So any sort of analysis on EID in the context of, of uh, risk factors is a bit fraught with um, non-specificity. In other words, you know, you apply, uh, you know, uh, an analysis on the broad definition of EID and there are such different things and with different pathways and you know pathogenesis and so on that I think it it really it, it doesn't help and so I so we felt initially there was a, a a lack of specificity really in the whole way of looking at this problem and that we needed to 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 bring that out so definitions became a very important part of our analysis actually to try and understand how these things have evolved next slide please yeah and so one of the aspects of this was to try and tease out this whole use of the term zoonosis. So I, I sort of like, I think it's, it's you know, the, 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 the original definitions were perfectly okay, but they've sort of been, their use has been expanded in a way which is not very helpful. So I think the WHO definition is good, that zoonosis is a naturally transmitted direct infection between humans and animals. And what this really means is that you have an animal reservoir and, and it is, you know, the infection is directly acquired from, from the animal or indirectly, say through food, you know, it could be a dead animal or, or a fomite or something relating to that animal. So that's really what we're talking about. Um, and then, of course, this whole idea that, that uh, it, it also really describes uh, a reverse aspect too, that you, you know, these organisms might go from a human to an animal. Um, and we, we call it zoanthroponosis or reverse zoonosis. So in our analysis, we felt it was important to break this link between, if you like, endemic common zoonosis that occur regularly from an animal reservoir infecting a human uh, and zoonotic origin uh, pathogens of humans, which may not be uh, an ongoing animal to human infection problem. Um, and you know, many of these emerging infectious diseases are described as zoonosis, but actually they no longer really rely on animals. So you know, they are a human disease. Um, and, uh, and I think that's an important distinction. Next slide. So we, we tried to sort of break down where do zoonosis and where do EID come from? Um, because there's been a lot of this use of sort of percentages. I hate percentages because it's by percentage of what? Um, <clears throat> and they, they tend to be the sort of uh, strap lines, um, you know, sound bites that are used to try and promote a particular position in, in relation to, to disease and emergence and threat and risk. Um, and, I, and I feel very uncomfortable with that. Uh, so we sort of just broke this down and we said, well, OK, if we look at um, uh, Zoonotic ID and, and, and excellent work has been done over the years of trying to sort of break this all down, uh, you know, by by people like Jones, Willhouse, uh, Cleveland, um, you know, Taylor, many many people that um, uh, I'm sure we all we all know or have heard of, um, you know, did have done excellent work in in breaking this down. And and what really struck me about this is that yes, you know, zoonotic origins are important in the ID. And being a sort of wildlife person, I say to myself, well, where else would they come from? I mean, you know, where else would new things come from but, but from biodiversity? Um, anyway, so, so we've got um, various percentages that have been pr produced. So if we look at that uh, overall uh, human emerging infectious disease, around about 60 odd percent. So in red, the red uh, uh, at the top there. And, and then if you break that down, um, actually, uh, into those which come from wildlife and those that come from domestic animals, if we look at the origins of these things, of course, most of it does come from biodiversity. And so that's where this figure of 70 odd percent or whatever comes from. But when you look at actual zoonosis, the actual cases of infection of humans um, from animals, 99% come from domestic animals. Um, and, and so we get this sort of confusion, I think, uh, around this whole issue. Um, and it's, it's sort of important that we get a proportionate feel to this. Next slide, please. 
So yeah, just to summarize, you know, the common narrative of the 70% AID from wildlife, but the truth is it's only about 43% of all EID of humans. Um, and most of those actually are just genetic origin and aren't ongoing zoonosis. And I just want to, you know, put that down as a, you know, as a, a, a something that we need to bring into narrative to get a better proportionality to the problem. Next slide, please. So if we look at actual zoonosis, uh, it is rare. I mean, and you know, we know that in human health, it, you know, most uh, medical doctors, if you ask them, how many zoonoses do you see a week? They'll say, well, none. Um, and you know, how many in a year? And they say, well, maybe one. So it's, it's, it, they are very rare actually in, in context of the overall burden of disease of humans. And that's why in the global burden of disease, they're not actually uh, really uh, differentiated. Um, so, so this is a big problem. And I think it's one of the central problems about really resolving this whole issue of, of animal related disease in humans is getting a much better handle on that. Next slide, please. And if we also look at global trends in human mortality, we mustn't forget that, you know, the biggest cause of mortality is air pollution. Um, so if we look at the different categorizations, non-communicable and cu communicable, um, you know, uh, we, we, we must get this balance, uh, you know, in, in our minds. Uh, but of course, infectious disease is important, but actually over, over the 20th century and this century, there's been a ma major advances in, in control and, and reduction in human infectious disease. So I know it's very counter to the current narrative, but I think we must keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So what is the problem about animals that is causing all the fuss about human disease? Um, I think it's the perceptions, really. Uh, are, uh, you know, it goes back to Pandora's box and this whole idea that everything bad sort of comes from that dark forest. <clears throat> so I think that's very much in our human psychology and, and it's something that's easily you know, uh, converted into narrative. And of course, when we have an event like COVID and the, the uh, species uh, is, is uh, mentioned, the bat, you know, everybody then says, well, of course, you know, this is exactly what, I mean, we've always known this. But, um, but it, anyway, it just reinforces that idea that everything does come, you know, from, from nature. Next slide, please. But I just want to point out, and, and there was a very good uh, paper I felt on, on looking at the sort of proportionality by Barr on et al. in 2019. It's a complicated picture, this, and I, I don't want you to look too close at it, but, but what it really comes down to is, you know, 96% of global mammal biomass is human and livestock. Um, and so actually, you know, this, this is the real issue now in that. And when we look at the microbial world, uh, their biomass is even bigger than our biomass. By, by a very large proportion. So, you know, we need to just remember that, that, you know, this world is mostly microbial uh, and, and we're actually a rather rare entity on, on Earth. And of course, in addition to that, biodiversity is on a cliff edge. Next slide, please. And I think this is a much better picture to look at because it gives you a sense of proportionality. If we look at the millions of tons of, um, of, of mammals, um, uh, you know, uh, this is really what it is. So wildlife is incredibly small proportion now of the overall biomass of life um, that, is, that is particularly important to us. Next slide, please. And just to reinforce that, when we look at trade, I think it's so important. So that uh, red arrow points to something you can hardly see, which is the uh, actual tr uh, global livestock meat production um, uh, figures and and game meat is in there. It, it hardly uh, it hardly it, you know, it can be seen. So you know the majority of meat um, on this uh, on the planet is 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 uh, domestic. Next slide, please. So it's a it's a minuscule proportion of the meat trade, but the volumes are still significant. I mean, we're still talking millions of tons um, and they obviously have their own context and certainly would carry no less uh, kilogram per kilogram risk uh, for human pathogens. Um, but, you know, I think it's again important to get proportion right. But actually the evidence is not strong for zoonosis source from wild meat. There's not a lot of data there to tell us anything about it. Uh, but, but volume issues I think are important. So it's, I'm sure there is a risk, uh, but it will be very much influenced by volume. And then of course we know that particular domestic meats are, are closely associated with zoonosis, poultry meat for example. Next slide please. Just to, to mention, of course, the world is now one. Uh, so we have incredible movements of, of animals, people, etc., uh, around the world, the products. Um, and, and we have many associations of movements of organisms and diseases associated with that. So we have a sort of globalization and connectivity, which is really, really important in this whole 
idea of what you know, drives pandemics. Next slide. So trade is important, no doubt. And human passenger numbers just continue to go up uh, until COVID, of course, but I'm sure they're going to pick up again soon. Next slide. Yeah, so we could sort of compartmentalize uh, all these major threats into a whole bunch of areas, you know, in a one health way or, you know, looking at sectors and disciplines, you know, looking at society more generally. And, and there are attempts to do this now increasingly. And of course, we use the one health uh, agenda as a way to sort of uh, package these things. Next slide. But in the end, we want to find some practical way to reduce this pandemic risk. Um, and, and I think Prediction, and there's been a lot of emphasis on prediction, and I, I, I think as COVID showed, you, you can't predict these things. It's extremely difficult. Um, and, you know, everybody wants to be able to do that, but I think that, you know, it's virtually impossible, as there are infinite possibilities. Uh, so I think we have to reflect on that, and we need to think a bit more practically and logically as to how to go forward. Taking action, I think, is important, and, you know, uh, our analysis really shows that we can certainly reduce risk, and, and there are some obvious ways of doing that. If we lower the animal population, that's the human domestic animal population, this will achieve um, you know, a reduction in risk. And if we have dietary shifts, um, this will help. I mean, it, you know, we could reduce uh, meat consumption and increase plant uh, consumption without affecting our health, uh, and it will have major positive benefits to, to disease risk, but also to climate change and, and land use and, and so forth. We can also reduce connectivity and spread, so the pandemic uh, sort of risk factors, by improving our management of travel uh, and artificial movements of humans and animals. We can apply more quarantine type measures and we can monitor things better. And I think, you know, these are the things that really could make a big difference. We don't really monitor the wildlife trade as, as well as we do the domestic animal trade. And I think this is a fundamental problem and error that needs to be addressed. Next slide. Uh, we, we can, you know, everything's globalized now and everything's interdependent. So land, this is a map showing how there's a, a global in, interdependence uh, of land between countries. So things are grown elsewhere, eaten elsewhere. And, and so, the, you know, it's all based now on this incredible movement of things uh, around the world. And this, this has real implications for pandemics. Next slide, please. And of course, there are many other actions that we could take in human society to improve the healthiness of our environment. Um, and some of these may reduce the pandemic risk um, and, and achieve much more as well. Next slide. So we can think about, you know, reducing habitat loss and degradation. Next slide. Invasive species could be reduced. Next slide. Pollution could be reduced. Next slide. Waste, over har harvesting, over exploitation, all with direct and indirect benefits. Next slide. Climate change. Next slide. And of course, coming back to wildlife trade, there are some specific examples where problems were identified and through management and control of that trade, the problem simply went away. And I think one of the very few documented um, examples um, of, of disease and wildlife trade is, is the monkeypox virus and the pet trade into the United States. And, and through effective control of that, we've not seen that problem happen again. So I think it is you know, very valuable to have very specific and context relevant um, data on these things so that you can actually manage whatever the trade is in a very specific way. Next slide. So for my part of this talk, I'm gonna conclude now <clears throat> and say what the challenges are so obviously health is fundamental to social, cultural, economic and political outcomes of societies and vice versa. So health is, is really central and it has, you know, it's, a, it's something that we can benefit from, obviously, but also in terms of policy change. So it's a real driver for policy change. But the challenge is, is to get the message right, to get the evidence right so that the changes are appropriate and proportionate. Now, of course, reduction of science um, is, 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 is strongly influential, and I think it, it can prevent sustainable solutions. So I think we need constructivist approaches, which are, are really more in this one health, eco health sort of convergence, where we, we try and look at more holistic solutions that sort of reduce the need for um, interventions, you know, which require a lot of technology and so, so on. Um, not that we, you know, our technologies are not useful. It's just I think they, we, you know, we chase our tails sometimes. And I think this whole idea of loss of resilience um, 
because of our management of the environment um, and changes in uh, demographies, I think you know this is causing a big problem, and we we need to think. And hopefully, biodiversity recovery is a is a is a motivation actually to get more stability in the pathogen environment. And how to develop these solutions? I think we need um, obviously research is extremely important, but it's more than that. It's translation of that uh, evidence based. Uh, 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 approach to science that that then helps policy to move forward in, in a constructive and a socially and politically and economically acceptable way. Um, and, but I think it needs to be radical, um, and uh, you know, time will tell. Okay, uh, uh, Hernan, please carry on. Hernan, if I can just jump in here and uh, yes. with, uh, just looking at the watch. Um, Maybe if you can keep to 15 to 20 minutes, if that is at all possible, then we could have some time for discussion. Sorry for being... No, no worries. Thanks. I'll Thank try you my best. <laughs> Thanks, so uh, I'll continue the, the presentation. I'll focus on a kind of a sub-project that we did during the, um, this IUCN project, uh, large IUCN project, which is uh, wildlife use and trade. And we wanted to understand what are the risks and the hazards in relation to the, specifically to wildlife trade. So obviously, you know, this, uh, this uh, market, this is a one of seafood market. Now it's widely considered as a source of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this obviously launched the, this study uh, and launched a lot more, uh, I would say, in terms of discussions and international uh, agreements and international, obviously, uh, collaboration calls on how to move forward following this um, COVID pandemic. But to focus on wildlife trade, uh, to start with, like, what is wildlife trade? When we discuss wildlife trade, we often kind of lose the context. So in general, wildlife trade is a animal, plant, and fungi species, uh, and the, the trade of um, their products and derivatives as well. It has been a common practice globally since ancient times, um, and wildlife trade is a common part of life today around the world and links to indigenous peoples, poor and rural communities within uh, users and consumers. And in many countries, hunting, for example, is a tradition that is very common to see in the UK, in France, in the US, Canada, Australia, and many other countries. Um, it involves all types, so sustainable, unsustainable, legal, illegal trade, which also includes the sales and exchange of wild animals, parts, and subproducts. And its actual size is very difficult to assess. We know that it's, um, according to the latest reports, uh, it can be between 28 to 92 billion for global trade and illegal trade between 7 and 23, but these are just estimates and you can see that the range of them, so it's very hard to estimate how big it is. Um, and also it's very important as well to recognize the role in the livelihoods of up to 150 million people around the world. Um, but when we talk about wildlife trade, wildlife trade is not the same. We can look at it from a legality perspective, from a purpose or the type of use, from a sustainability, including animal welfare aspects, uh, the scale of it, it can be from local to international and the source. So we've seen also that this, all these um, dimensions kind of change throughout time. And so analyzing and designing effective policy is not that simple. We really need to understand the multiple sociocultural, economical, political, environmental factors that are in uh, at play when we are discussing wildlife trade. So in a paper from 2018, um, Harfoot basically what they saw was that they, they described uh, the, the legal trade in the, the site's listed wildlife. And uh, basically what they saw is that there's this big change from uh, capt from wild caught to wild to captive source um, species. So that's something that we wanted to look into it, these differences between what are the sources, where do they come from? And when we look into the CITES wildlife trade, we see that most of it are primates. It's actually in terms of volumes for mammals, primates are all almost off the chart in comparison to the other orders such as carnivores, ungulates, and Chiroptera and, and others. So when we look into a more detailed aspect of it, we realize that primates are primarily bred in captivity, followed by born in captivity and taken from wildlife. But that differs, for example, with what happens with uh, carnivores. So carnivores are mostly um, um, specimens that are taken from the wild. Uh, so these are the things that we need to look into it when we're trying to assess what's happening there. As uh, Richard was saying, these are very context dependent and we can just not kind of 
um, just analyze them as a whole. Um, so when we are discussing wildlife, why wildlife trade became this kind of big thing and why are we today uh, talking about it? So obviously it's an opportunity to for close contact between wildlife, livestock and humans. Uh, there are practices uh, that are associated with a risk of diseases. So for example, direct contact with blood. Uh, there are a variety of regulatory and policy frameworks. There are many unknowns in the system. Um, there are storage and transport conditions, same in the markets, etc. Um, it's an expanding global market and it has multiple dimensions. So again, it's a very complex um, system. So this is one of the reports that came out um, last year. And in this report, they out of the 275 zoonotic diseases that they identify, um, 25 were classified as having the highest risk to human health through expert consultation with OIE. So this is a very interesting thing because it is, in this line is relevant to differentiate what is a hazard from a risk. And moreover, not only uh, the diseases in this list, not all of them are actually significantly associated with wildlife trade. It means that they've been listed for that species. So this is a hazard, obviously. So basically, we wanted to go even further and try to define uh, these uh, different issues around wildlife trade. So we had these five driving questions. So the first one was to define the connection. Is it a confirmed connection, presumptive or suspected? So we define confirmed connection when the pathogen has been confirmed in both animal and human subjects by laboratory techniques such as ELISA, uh, PCR, antibody detection, etc. cetera. Uh, presumptive it would be when the pathogen has been confirmed in either animal or humans. Uh, uh, same with laboratory techniques and it'll be suspected when the pathogen has not been identified neither in animal or human subjects, but um, the disease symptoms are consistent with those of the suspected disease. So we can see these different levels of how we can define this connection. Today, I'm gonna focus on the confirmed uh, aspects of, uh, of the analysis. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, where the, the event took place, uh, what is the context in the wild of trade context in which this infection happened, what are the pathogens associated with wildlife use and trade, and what are the species associated to the events? So to tackle this issue, uh, we work with, um, with a, a big group of experts, among them Kiara Keenan, who is a research fellow in the Campbell UK in Ireland. She's an information retrieval expert that help us to uh, devise the uh, uh, define the, the the protocol and um, and be in line with the the latest methods, basically on how to conduct these uh, systematic searches. So the idea was to we, we defined that the best approach would be an evidence gap map to consolidate the evidence on what we know and what we don't know about the role that wildlife trade use and use use on um, human infectious diseases. So we search in six, six different electronic databases. And uh, we also carry out different consultation with experts and backward and forward searches. Uh, we got more than 5,000 scientific articles uh, that discuss wildlife trade and human diseases, and around 140 publications describe human cases in the context of wildlife use and trade. So we decided to use an evidence gap map because it help us to identify and summarize the existing um, scientific evidence that focus on potential links between wildlife trade and human diseases. Uh, this also includes marine infectious pathogens and zoonosis. The map and data will be publicly available in the upcoming weeks. So this is actually um, uh, linked to the report. And uh, the benefits of this approach is that funders can quickly assess the areas where there is already a saturation of evidence to set in a way. So you can identi quickly identify the gaps in knowledge and direct these um, scarce resources towards those areas to advance the, the field. Practitioners and policymakers, they can actually assess the map and see what's the evidence that exists to inform policy and practice. Researchers can minimize the, the research waste, um, which occurs by duplication of effort, for example, and the members of the public can actually go and quickly assess the information that is relevant to it in a very friendly uh, manner. So if you want to read the protocol of how to how we did this, rest, uh, this search and all the, the terms, et cetera, that's already published. Um, so you can go there. Um, so this is just the, the classic Prisma chart 
um, out of the more than 5,000, we actually had to exclude 4,000, almost 4,500 due to the fact that they didn't actually fit it into the, the, the type of um, question that we were, um, that we wanted to answer. So the, the focus on this thing was the human disease outbreak needs to be related to a human disease outbreak. So it, there needs to be this link. It, it cannot be just that they're mentioning it. There needs to be a link to a human disease, um, either an individual or a population. And the wildlife trade, the, with the link to wildlife trade, it needs to be that the outbreak occur. It can be either presumed, suspected, or confirmed, as I mentioned, within the context of wildlife trade being legal or illegal. So in the end, following the, the primary and secondary screening and, um, and an extraction process that we carry out with uh, about 20 people, we identify around 137 articles that um, were part of this, um, that were suitable for the study. So out of the 137, we con have uh, 47 that are confirmed cases. And this is just to give you an idea of the timeline, so the, the earliest is in 1993 and the latest obviously 2021. Um, but as you can see, there are not many. The, the, there are, the maximum was seven per year in 2017. So that's not a lot of information actually linking these two issues. So as I said, we're going to focus on the confirmed aspects of this, and we're going to look into where did the event where did the event took place, what is the context in which the infection happened, what are the pathogens that are associated with wildlife use and trade, and what are the species that are associated to these um, events. So the first part is the the event took place mostly in the reports are actually from Asia, so 32 percent, followed by Europe by 26 and Africa um, with uh, 21%. So there's, uh, there are reports obviously worldwide um, and only 4% of the studies were actually focused on something that is, they were mentioning as a global study. So that's a, just a multi-regional study. Then the context in which this infection happened. So the first is the commercial setting. So for example, um, then followed by hunting, so primarily sport hunting, uh, mostly in Europe, and then subsistence settings. Um, then it's, I think it's important also to mention that commercial system include what it's called um, um, live poultry markets. So following the outbreaks of influenza, there there seems to be this um, this peak on studies that were that took place in uh, poultry markets. The issue with that is that we don't know the species, so we know that it's uh, birds, but we don't know what animals or if these uh, these are actually wild species that are being um, that are in the system or these are domestic species. So we decided to include them just so we didn't lose any sort of um, information on the. Uh, or resolution, basically. Followed by that, so the groups that are associated with the event, 83% uh, are mammals, followed by birds, uh, that's 9%. But this, this type of birds is what I was mentioning, these are live poultry markets, and then birds are actually wild, um, and then obviously 2% are amphibians. So when we look at the species level, uh, actually, 62% are known species. 38% uh, is this, this either a group or a, on our order or something that we cannot really track. So at the species level, this is just to give you an idea that the, the most common confirmed case uh, are actually wild board and followed by species that are related to either, uh, for example, the mass bulb civets. Uh, this would be with SARS. And non-human private uh, primates. This is just something that in a group that is um, that's not specific. So um, when we actually link and group all the ones that are unconfirmed, unconfirmed or unspecific, um, it's the, the most common. So it's very hard to track back these cases uh, to a species or a group that we don't really know. Um, uh, we, but that actually we don't we don't know or it wasn't reported. So obviously there's a gap there in how we're reporting and how we're carrying out the studies or the details that we need to actually follow back and track back 
these uh, outbreaks within wildlife trade um, contexts. So then we look at the, the diseases. Uh, so in the in the case of the confirmed cases, hepatitis E was actually the most common to be confirmed, followed by SARS, then influenza, and then we have other species that are related to pet trade, for example, such as chlamydia and uh, chlamydophila pisitasi, which is cytokosis and salmonellosis, or virus is another one that is related to hunting, for example, uh, trichinella, same thing, then Ebola. So we know that there's very low numbers of reports. So Adonan, for the sake of yes. time, maybe can I push you forward a little bit? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so just to give you a summary of this, only around 2.5% of the papers found, that, which are the hits during the search for field day inclusion criteria with only with less than 1% containing confirmed cases. Um, so hazard identification is not uh, risk assessment on high level purpose. So this is uh, basically looking at the commercial setting, not really being um, specific about it were the most common elements that were described in the, in the publications and with the majority of publications lacking information regarding the supply chain and transmission context, which is something that also was found by um, the, in the OI report that um, Stephen Craig presenting, presented. Then the lack of specific information about the context and specific, specific data makes it um, difficult to actually assess uh, and carry out a risk assessment based on these type of approaches. So obviously, if we look at the majority of the confirmed cases, we're looking at the hunting as the primary case, for example. So wild boars are the most common um, mentioned species. So just to give you a little bit more of the a well-known context, and this is very short. So I'm going to give you an example of deer um, in Europe. So this is a project that we did with uh, wildlife traffic. Uh, sorry, the USAD, uh, UCN, and traffic is called the wildlife trafficking response assessment and priority settings of wildlife traps. And this was just to, to, to create a, um, an outline of the supply chain of deer in, uh, in Europe. So the important thing is that we follow the, the supply chain. The answer to those risks is a multi-level legislation that is from the international level, European, national, then the department, etc. So you have an integration of the whole supply chain. So in general, when you know the supply chain, you know the hazards, and then you have the, the legislation to support them the government bodies, you can apply systems such as um, the hazard analysis and critical control points. And um, so, yeah, and this is just to mention that I wonder how now we'll see this type of thing. So, for example, now we have this, um, the reports of white-tailed deer uh, that were infected with SARS-CoV-2 as um, uh, free population. So this creates a, a whole new level of, uh, of uh, a whole new dimension, to say it in a way. Um, and then just to wrap it up, so what we can do on uh, an existing, for example, response, as I was saying, is the HACCP approach. Uh, it's a method that has been used in food systems since the 1960s. It's uh, widely used and um, and basically approved. Uh, it's currently being used domestically um, for international trade in kangaroo, deer, ostrich, and other markets. Um, so it's something that we can basically try to not reinvent the wheel, as Richard was mentioning in the, in the presentation. So obviously targeted bans and practices uh, or species trade will certainly have a role when we can actually go and look into the, uh, the systems. So yes, and to wrap it up, this is just something that came up uh, today. Uh, and it was very interesting because there were 11 hamsters that were uh, detected uh, and positive for COVID-19. And now Hong Kong is actually taking back the whole um, uh, achievement that came from the Netherlands with 2,000 hamsters. So I thought that it would be interesting to have that discussion and how pet trade also is part of the wildlife trade. And we tend not to look at it as part of it. So thank you very much. And that was my presentation. Thank you so much, Evnan and uh, Richard. Thanks so much. Um, and sorry for pushing you on a little bit. But uh, I do want to open the floor in a moment to comments, questions, and the discussion, because I see uh, a wealth of expertise and knowledge in our audience. So I think it would be nice to to build on that and bring them in here. Thanks for elaborating so um, broadly and bringing a, a whole 
uh, wealth of details of, of uh, data in, into the presentation. And I do have a couple of questions and comments, but I'll stay back and first open the floor to anyone who wants to comment, raise a, an issue, ask a question, please do feel free. We have time until a quarter to six at least. And um, with that, let's use that, anyone. Maybe Sarah Cleveland, you can um, unmute yourself and post your question. Thanks very mm -hmm. much. Um, that was really interesting, um, both uh, presenters and Hernan. I've been really keen to see that uh, those analyses carried out. It's a huge amount of work, and I really appreciate um, those efforts. That was that was really interesting. Um, it's a question that I've had for a long time, and I've never, I think, to myself, had a satisfactory answer as to why we justify the, except for conservation translocations, apart from that one example, the international movement of live wild animals, why we countenance the trade across borders. So if there's the demand for live wild animals, why those could not be sourced or should not be sourced domestically? And it's not just the disease risks. Um, uh, there, or to humans, there's risks to other animals, there's invasive um, species problems, there's animal welfare issues. And we know how hard it is when we can't even identify not just the level of species, but often even to class the species in these live shipments. And there's been huge resistance whenever I've mentioned this. Um, and I'm just not quite sure why it would be such a, a difficult issue to think about. I know ban is a really pejorative word, but it would simplify things hugely. You just can't move live wild animals across borders. And if you have a trade in live wild animals, that needs to be sourced and sustained domestically. So I just wondered if anyone's got any thoughts on that. I, I'll jump in quickly. It's so nice to see you, Sarah. And you too. I, I think, you know, look, I, I think, you know, we have this sort of ideal frame for doing things. If one, if one banned live wild animals, wouldn't we need to ban live domestic animals as well? I mean, what, you know, what would be the, you know, for some people, of course, you know, wildlife so important to some people, domestic animals are really important to other people. So, you know, the question is why, you know, I sort of agree in principle that that would make a lot of sense if we just stopped moving live animals around, full stop. But actually, I don't think you could differentiate between wild and domestic. Can you? But perhaps you, you can argue the case. There are certainly legal definitions and distinctions between those. They could be, and it is much would be much easier to distinguish and identify a domestic animal species than the millions and millions of wild animal species that get shipped around the world, which, you know, sometimes even to the level of class, they're not identified. Um, and so I'm not saying there shouldn't be a trade, but that trade should be domestic. Yeah, it's a philosophical point, isn't it? You know, not, but not whether really that because of the implementation of the, because you know yeah. the implementation is so difficult when you start to you know to try and introduce all these complexities about this species on this type of uh, is a high risk for disease and therefore it shouldn't be traded. It becomes incredibly difficult to monitor. Uh, and I, I don't. Becomes, I don't disagree. Uh, I don't disagree, and I, you know, there is, you know, that that is one of the challenges, I think, and it's the same with CITES and trying to determine yeah. what they actually. So yeah, so I think that that practicality is is a, is a good argument, if we could link risk, with that lack of knowledge. I mean, if we could demonstrate that that lack of knowledge leads to increased incidence, for example, of say zoonosis or emerging pathogens arising through that route. But until one's got that data, and until one can actually demonstrate that risk and that problem, I think it would be very difficult to, you know, because because these are livelihoods. These are people's, you know, livelihoods and um, yeah, but, but but thank you, Sarah. I don't know if Hernan's got any comments on that. Well, I think uh, it's something that we need to discuss and, and that's the whole point, right? I think at the moment mm -hmm. we're still trying to develop these different approaches on how we're going to sort it out. Uh, we still, for example, we have an example of the bans of uh, live imports um, for uh, live birds, for example, in Europe following the influenza. Uh, we know that, that what, what that produced was just a shift on the production systems and how they were actually moving, not just stopping um, the system. So that, for example, that's a, an example that we can follow. 
but I would say that there's also a lot of political and social willingness that we need to discuss. What are it's not only the disease aspects that you were that you were mentioning, but also there's a very good example of how a ban on the imports of of live birds that were coming from Argentina, for example, um, it actually had a bigger effect on conservation of those species. Um, uh, and it's just this uh, this unwanted effect from the from the from the the, the ban coming into into Europe. So I think th this system we tend to think in a very simplistic manner in terms of what are the species that we're gonna stop or what are the trades that we're gonna stop, how cost effective would be to implement certain things. But we need to also think that we've been dealing with 16 species, for example, the domestic list, uh, 16 annuals for uh, for centuries. So so maybe we need to take a little bit more time to actually look at the evidence, try to look for it and decide as a, as a whole community what we're going to uh, do to move forward. And, and I would say also we need to be very mindful of uh, colonialistic or neo-colonialistic mind of telling people what to do um, without actually looking at what's happening on the other side of the of the pond to say it in a way. Thank you. Uh, I see there is a, you want to react, uh, don't you, Sarah? Um, I'd love to give you the, the chance. <laughs> <laughs> I can Let's see what other topics are <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so thanks very much for bringing that up. And also thank you for putting us into the perspective, looking at possible answers. Um, and, and I think Anan or, or Richard said they need to be socially and politically acceptable. Well, I think that's obviously for, for us as Alliance, we want to, as Richard also put it, Put it translate evidence into policy and if we can maybe take that um focus i'm sure there are further comments um questions or um reactions please anyone and maybe sarah if nobody wants to go yeah. ahead then please come back <laughs> maybe Anna. maybe sasha you want to raise your comment in the in the group or just put it in the chat if you like sasha knauf <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm switching on my phone, uh, my mic. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for the nice presentations. I just raised a point that I think is quite uh, critical. Um, it's more a comment. I think we have to be very careful when talking about confirming in pathogens in wildlife and then linking them easily to human health. I think there's more than that. Um, one aspect uh, that is easy to understand is if you take, uh, for example, a pathogen that needs a, a vector species and the vector species is no longer there, then you, you miss the feasible transmission route and there is no risk anymore and you cannot easily link it to human health. Even if you identify genetically identical pathogens in humans and wildlife, then not, needs not necessarily to be a risk uh, involved in this um, if ecological uh, the ecological context is missing. So I think we have to be very careful and you see the same, I think Richard already uh, mentioned it, you see that whatever we talk about, whatever we publish, whatever we say uh, openly, that has consequences for wildlife species. Uh, and uh, as long as we have no proof to say that there is um, that all bat species are involved in the transmission of uh, SARS and, and whatever is out there and Ebola, I think we have to be careful because the consequence is that uh, people uh, want to uh, eliminate maybe populations of bats and things like that. So the consequences for wildlife are enormous um, and we have to be sure about the risk that we finally um, want to point out that comes from a wild species. Um, so I, I think that's an important consideration. It's more a comment. Thanks, Sasha. Yes, thanks very much. That's very useful. And, uh, you know, I just I saw another comment Jim Siegel was saying about uh, animal populations that harbor anthrax. And I think this sort of illustrates some of the misunderstandings around zoonosis. You know, anthrax is often described as a, a zoonosis, but actually, you know, there's evidence now that it's a vegetative form surviving in soil. So it's really a soil organism. Uh, 
and uh, it just so happens that herbivores graze um, and get, you know, uh, take in the anthrax spore um, and get a vegetative septicemia, and they die very quickly. And then, in the process of, you know, of 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 breaking down, they release further spores, and and then people come into contact, and that's where that zoonosis story comes from. But it's not really a zoonosis in the classic sense, so it doesn't sort of it doesn't come from live animals. So, so no animals carry it. I mean, they die from it. It's uh, an environmental thing. So, uh, yeah, so I think there's, when it comes to this whole story, there's, you know, a lot of lumping together, which, you know, is, is, is a, a real challenge. Uh, and I think in this issue, I, just to bring out this issue of, of um, diagnosis and uh, conf confirmation of zoonosis, it is difficult because often a human case goes to a clinic, um, but its story as to how it got the infection often is lost, you know, in, in, the, in the details. And, and they treat it and it gets better and that's the end of it. <clears throat> but um, we need more of that. In the, so in other words, a lot of this discussion is within the sort of wildlife and the domestic animals sort of veterinary field. But actually, we need many more public health people and, and medical people to get engaged on this and start improving our, you know, the, the diagnosis of zoonosis. In other words, yeah. that we can get a clear link and we know the animals that are associated. And that way, I think we'll get a much stronger evidence base with which to move forward. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't seen a lot of that debate even from WHO. I mean, you know, uh, if they on the global burden of disease statistic, if they actually said, no, we must know this, then I think it could put in, in process a whole bunch of things. And of course, the veterinary services and so on and the HACCP approach and the hazard approach. But, you know, we, we can build up huge lists of things. And I, I've heard recently people talking about 700,000 viruses that are potentially zoonotic pathogens but you know that's not the reality there are 1400 pathogens of which you know uh, a, a certain number are, are viruses and bacteria fungus and so on but you know it, it doesn't help I think to create this sort of uh, you know uh, dramatic view of of our planet you know we've survived pretty well for a long time um, but you know we need to understand what's happening now in terms of pandemic risk I think because of the the circumstances we're in thanks I think maybe can I come in here and say uh, stress what you just said the pandemic risks and um, with the last uh, couple of minutes maybe 10 minutes to go I really like to focus on what you also write in your situation report, the, the paper that is coming out in terms of recommending uh, things, uh, recommendations, uh, specific recommendations. And one thing you, you say is um, increase the understanding, which you've stressed just now as well, um, but also uh, in, improve national and international disease surveillance, which you just said, including um, that along the entire trade chain, supply chain, um, and you call on on the tripartite or the tripartite plus, and I do see that Thomas Mettenleiter is in the call, so I I don't want to put you on the spot, Thomas, but um, maybe you can react to what as as OLEP as One Health high level expert panel uh, chief, so to speak. What do you take from this, or what what in terms of looking into policy recommendations, recommendations for tripartite? Is there anything you want to share with us? Um, I think that might be interesting to get it moving to that direction, please. I mean, from my point of view, thanks. Oops. Sorry, uh, you have to unmute yourself again, Thomas Madeleine. Now it should work because I just okay. click on the microphone, then next. Uh... Is it working now? Yeah, now perfect. Thank you. OK, <laughs> so yeah, thanks very much. And, and thanks very much also for the presentations. I think I mean, what for me has, has become uh, clear is that we have still, I mean, a lot of a lot of gaps in knowledge. I mean, basically, I mean, there is uh, that there was um, pretty impressively presented. Uh, I mean, where the gaps actually are, and this is one of the one of the tasks that OLEP has taken on board, and it's, it's a part of our terms of reference. I mean, to identify these research gaps, and I mean, we'll definitely be in, be in touch with uh, Richard and and Anne as well, uh, because I mean, this is exactly what we need to do. We have to focus. I mean, what we have in terms of resources. I mean, we know a lot 
in different issues, but we also lack a lot of knowledge in others. And um, in, in, in particular, I think the numbers that say, I mean, I mean, how many documented cases do we actually have in terms of zoonotic transmission? Uh, um, and, and that, I mean, with consequence, I mean, we know that we have probably a tre tremendous number of spillover events that are just, I mean, one time they happen and then, I mean, the whole thing disappears because, I mean, the pathogen doesn't take hold on the other population, be it from humans to animals or from animals to humans. <clears throat> but I mean, the cases that are really relevant for us and our consideration that are the ones that lead to, I mean, these initial infection chains, and these are the ones that, that we need to detect. And basically, again, in, in, in both directions. Uh, so I think, I mean, this is, this is an, an, a major issue. I mean, of course, I mean, Sarah has, has, has been uh, um, uh, in, in this discussion or is, is in the discussion. I mean, of course, there is always the discussion in terms of trade, um, being wildlife, being domestic trade, uh, uh, domestic animal trade over, over large distances. I mean, how much this contributes uh, to, uh, I mean, appearance and spread of, of infections. Um, but I mean, the most mobile population are still humans. I mean, so basically, I mean, we we are the ones. I mean, oh, you are unmuted. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Uh, Thomas, can you can you unmute yourself again? I. Thomas, we can't hear you. If only one could lip read. <laughs> and I just Thomas. saw that most of my stuff that wasn't heard because for whatever reason, my mic was uh, fed up with my deliberations <laughs> and just <laughs> shut off. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> But but I hope I mean the message that I wanted to, to bring across is indeed I mean if you're talking about spread and mobile populations I mean it's 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 really the human population that we need need to consider first um, and if we uh, wanna wanna be prepared for the next one or prevent the next one I think I mean this is something that we definitely have to think about uh, about ways of uh, I mean this confinement at very early stages after detection. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, well, now I'm shutting off the mic. Um, <laughs> and deliberately so. We have a couple of comments in the chat. Yes. And um, I think Alberto, Alberto was in the beginning. Maybe he wants to raise his question mm -hmm. now. Thanks, Anna. Alberto, you can just turn on your microphone if you want to raise your question again. Or if you're not here. And Gustavo, I can see mm -hmm. you also had a question or a comment. Maybe you want to bring it in here. Yeah, maybe Gustavo, you go ahead if Alberto is not here anymore. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. here. Thank you so much. Uh, no, my, my comment is that, um, of course, uh, there's no doubt that trade is, 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 is a risk uh, activity. But my point is uh, there are, a lot of other industries, let's say, that have big, we should keep an eye on this. For instance, tourism, I think. So the so the same the, the connection that you mentioned of people around the world is not just only by trade, which of course is obvious. No, I'm not have nothing against that uh, at that point. Uh, but uh, the the same people, yeah. So going to one place to the other, in some way they are connecting wildlife or risk of certain disease in a certain place to another place without any uh, interchange of di or direct interchange of the material, let's say, through through the, the humans that, you know, well, um, before Corona it was, I think in the last years, there was a huge expand of, of tourism, uh, let's say, in, in countries or in areas which traditional was not so uh, maybe so common, well, let's say. Uh, and I think this is also something that uh, should be taken account. Thanks. Thank you for that, I, Alberto. Now, I, please. I think just, just I quickly think comment that on that. Was two oh, Gustavos. Okay. Sorry. I think that was two Gustavos. 
That's true. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for the excellent class. And uh, I'm from Brazil. Uh, I am physician here, uh, epidemiologist, and the research of uh, Paraná University Federal. Then okay. here, uh, I think that the 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 problem is not about only uh, the wide trade, uh, wildlife trade, but uh, here we have a big problem too about uh, the wildlife contact. We have uh, some some people, some groups uh, of uh, indigenous. Uh, they have uh, a lot of contact with wildlife, and uh, in in moment we have a uh, research about uh, specifically about this, the contact with wildlife, and uh, what is the consequence about this one. Mm -hmm. Then I think the the wildlife trade is a problem. But the contact to wildlife, specifically naturally, is a problem too to to think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo. And I think Richard wanted to react. Yeah, to I was just going to comment on, these, yeah, on these these issues. I, you know, I think the the problem with narrative at the moment is that it's 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 more about supposition. It's mostly hypothetical, um, and some some circumstantial so you have circumstantial so in other words it sort of makes sense you know that we should get a problem um but we just don't have the evidence to to you know concrete evidence to support that and i think if you want to get policy change if you want to get you know people to listen to you ultimately where livelihood changes are required etc you've got to get evidence that's really solid you know so i think it's you know our appeal is to say look there's so many uncertainties there's such a lack a lack of evidence and it's not surprising Wildlife people um, working in this field are rare. You know, they're getting like wildlife. They're they're rare, and so the domestic animal and the human health side of things. There are loads of people, but but none of them are working in this area. So we, you know, there's a capacity issue and there's a resource issue. And I think if that can be addressed, even to you know to to 10% better than it was, I think we'll begin to learn a lot more, and and we'll, there'll be an acceleration, and it will begin to point towards what you know, looks to be sensible approaches, you know, as Sarah raised, you know, let's just ban li live trade, you know, it's a great sort of concept. Um, and, you know, and it doesn't necessarily affect indigenous people or subsistence activities, etc. So, you know, I think that, you know, many of us as conservationists and so on argue, and I think there's never been, I mean, conservationists will always say, look, a lot of this trade is just damaging, you know, it's just bad for biodiversity. Um, and, you know, I think we, we'd all agree with that, but it's just that we, our world's made up with complex communities and, and you know, people see things very differently. And I think we, we need to have a rationale that's based on evidence. And I, I, I would say that's the biggest message from our work is that we're saying, where's the evidence, you know? Thanks. Thank you so much, Richard. That would have been a beautiful um, end word and ending this session, but I do have one hand up and I don't want to disregard uh, Dr. Maurice Frank. So please come in here and then I'd like to wrap up the session because I, I, I like doing this punctually being German. So <laughs> Maurice, please. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. OK, so I'm um, coming from the Caribbean. Um, OK, so regarding the work that was done, um, great presentations from the both of you. Um, I'd just like to know, did you both find that there were quite a few gaps regarding Caribbean outputs? Like, have you all noticed that the Caribbean is lacking in that knowledge base? Because as was brought up earlier, we've noticed that, yes, you do have issues in Latin America and the Caribbean where it's difficult to finance some of these research projects. It's difficult to get people to publish. Um, we have quite a few issues in terms of collaboration, in terms of getting persons to work together effectively. Um, what have you all found in the research regarding what's coming out of this region? I'll come in quickly. I, I think, you know, I mean, your region is one region. It's just similar to many, many regions. You know, the literature is dominated. 
as usual, by you know a, a minority of people um, and groups around the world when it comes to wildlife health and wildlife infection and risk and so on. So, so we have this sort of bias, I think. Um, you know, and the English literature is also a bias. And so, the, you know, I mean, we we didn't, you know, look in the Russian literature. The, you know, we we tried to access information. Uh, you know, from places like China and so on, but you know, through expert consultation, etc., to try and identify. Uh, but it, but it's it's really difficult. Now, I think you know your region might well be a good example. As I said to you, capacity is not there, systems are not there. Um, in other words, the information is not being gathered. You know, on a multilateral basis um, and not at a national basis, etc. So so I think until that sort of thing changes, um, and I you know I would just encourage all health sector people. To, to think about this and say, well, is the risk justification for diversion of resources? Because you may have to, you know, divert some resources in health from air pollution or from, you know, other other causes of human death. And and in the end, somebody has to make that decision. Um, and so it is again comes back to this whole idea of proportionality. Let's get the proportionality right, um, and then we can invest appropriately. Uh, I'm sure there's potential in your region. I know that the veterinary schools and so on. There's some really good, you know, uh, communities. I'm sure the health sector, human health sector, is also has potential. But you know, it's going to need. Uh, local initiatives, I think, and it's going to need multilateral initiatives and things like this alliance, I think, which, which is just great. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Maurice, for raising that. And um, thank you, Richard, for reacting. Sorry, Anand, did I cut you off or can I? Uh, <laughs> well, just like a, a very, very short thing. So I think one of Go the ahead. key issues that we identify as well through the review, and, and I'm, we're not saying that this is an exhaustive evidence report of everything that we know. This is an exhaustive report of what is published and what is accessible. And in many cases, that's a big issue that we are not reporting many things. So we don't know and we cannot build up policies and international actions and actually build up on that evidence because there's just, we don't have that evidence. So for example, I think the wild boar for me, it's a, it, it was a very surprising um, finding. And that's just because a lot of it is coming from Europe. There are labs. You can pay for the publication fees as well, for example. So we know that there are a lot of gaps in between, not only for the sampling, for example, if you're working in a university or in a research center, you go, you need to go through ethics, um, ethics to work with humans. It can take years. So we know that there's a buildup of things that are hampering the, the, the findings in terms of evidence and reporting. So I think we need to get better as well. At, uh, at tackling those issues, uh, and I think uh, the, the last um, the last uh, question from uh, from Dr. Maurice was actually in that line as well. Uh, and it's only only in that region we see the same in, in Latin America, for example, and in other countries. So this is something that I think international alliances can uh, play a big role. Right, fully and, agree. Thank yes. you. And maybe Alberto can still, because no, uh, he wanted to raise it, no? Okay. About sorry, Anna, I'll, I'll cut everybody off because I, I would like to finish up. Thank you so much, Alberto, for raising the point. I think we read it of the reverse um, spillover. It's, it's certainly important, but I do want to um, thank Anan and, and Richard for your input and your, your work overall. We are really looking forward to... Um, to seeing the report, to reading the the, the analysis in, in paper, and if you have it in proof uh, reading already, Richard, then we're hopeful to see it soon. Also, I'd just like to highlight, as as you pointed out, both Richard and Ananda, this is exactly what we like to do as, as Alliance, bring in um, discourse, foster the discourse, bring in different perspectives. Also, Sarah Cleveland, uh, you mentioned that, you know, that everybody comes from his or her own perspective, and this is what we try to do interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary um, foster even research. Um, Maurice, if you haven't been on our mailing list, we'd like to really include you because I think it it might, there's some opportunities for collaboration maybe in order to move forward by raising the unknown, by identifying the gaps and then um, both including local multilateral and other types of organizations uh, move the discourse forward. Thank you, Anan and Richard, also for your commitment to the Alliance and your work in the incubation group. Very helpful bringing in your data and your research and your insights. And uh, with that, I would like to wrap up. Sorry for cutting off any other questions, but it's always a best sign uh, when everybody's on board. We will have a next expert talk soon, and please watch this space and let us know um, uh, that we can send you the next invitation. Thank you so much and have a good 
evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. We're looking forward to fostering this course further and moving on. Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. Bye -bye. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.